Philip, thank you so much for your scene setting and uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, David. So um, we really have a kind of extended uh, panel this morning. Uh, we're going to have three presentations over the next hour uh, from Philip Mendes, Liz, Liz uh, uh, Beddo, uh, and then uh, a joint presentation from Kyo Ai Kua and Fuzia Shafi. Um, we're then going to have a 15-minute break. We're going to come back for three more presentations, and then we're going to have a sort of panel discussion, a general discussion, which I, I'd urge you all to, uh, to participate in to using the chat function to, to raise questions, uh, raise points of information, if you like. We will feed those into the discussion session uh, in about uh, two hours time, just over two hours. So uh, for the next hour, we're gonna have three presentations. I'll introduce each speaker properly just before they, they speak and ask each uh, of the people presenting to speak uh, for no more than uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we're we're going to uh, have the presentation themselves. We won't have questions immediately afterwards, but we'll, we'll keep the Q&A session uh, for, for that general discussion period. Um, so our first speaker, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Philip Mendes, who is Director of the Social Inclusion and Social Policy Research Unit, the Department of Social Work at Monash University in Australia. I'm delighted that he can, he can join us uh, today. Philip is a prolific author of, um, and co-author of 12 books, including Young People Transitioning from Out-of-Home Care, International Research Policy and Practice, um, co-edited with Pamela Snow, and the third edition of Australia's Welfare Awards, which was published in 2017. So Philip, thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Uh, good morning or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. So I'm gonna share my screen, just bear with me. And we'll go in a slideshow. So can everybody see that? Yes. Brilliant. All right. So to date, not a lot of uh, not a lot is known about the historical engagement of the Australian Association of Social Workers with Indigenous Affairs. So consequently, what I'm going to try and do today is to have a look at the history uh, of the activities and policies of the ASW on Indigenous issues from its formation in 1946 to the current day. So part one, 1946 to 1975. Social work in Australia was a very small profession for much of that period, given that very few universities were actually offering professional social work degrees. The ASW estimated in 1948 that there were no more than five or 600 professionally qualified social workers nationally. John Lawrence estimated in 1954 that the total number of social workers in actual employment nationally was merely 368. And even by 1970, the ASW only had a total membership of 1,244. So it seems likely that only a very limited number of social workers practiced directly with Indigenous families and communities during that period. The ASW was not active in social policy debates at all till approximately the mid 1960s. And they had very little to say on Indigenous issues. In fact, during that entire period, the Australian Social Work Journal only published seven articles 
on social work practice with Indigenous Australians. The first did not appear until 1969, and none of those articles at all dealt with policy issues such as coerced assimilation. The earliest AASW reference to Indigenous issues does not seem to have been till about 1950, when the Peak Community Welfare Body in Victoria, the Victorian Council of Social Service, uh, which worked closely with the AASW, partnered with the Social Work Department at the University of Melbourne to conduct a survey of the needs of the Indigenous population in the City of Melbourne. That survey specifically examined whether, whether the Indigenous community in the suburb of Fitzroy in Melbourne needed a social worker, but interestingly concluded that the community would resent being targeted as a disadvantaged group requiring assistance. In 1965, the Victorian State Branch of the AASW formed an Aboriginal Welfare Subcommittee to advocate changes to the administration of the State Aboriginal Welfare Board. And in 1967, that committee forwarded a submission to the State Government Minister recommending a committee of inquiry into Aboriginal welfare and the appointment of a social worker to a three-person board to conduct that inquiry. For reasons that are unclear though, that Victorian committee seems to have lapsed in 1968. Regardless, the National AASW passed a motion at their 1967 National Conference welcoming the passage of the May 1967 National Referendum, referendum giving the Commonwealth new responsibility for Aboriginal affairs and urging the Commonwealth to widely consult with representatives of Indigenous Australians and relevant professional groups, including social workers in developing their policy agenda. An editorial in the July 1968 AASW Federal Newsletter urged, quote, concrete action to not only give the fullest possible recognition to the rights of the only real Australians, but also to enable them to assume these rights to their fullest potential, quote unquote. There was a move to create a national AASW committee on Aboriginal welfare around this time that the proposal seemed to have floundered due to tensions between the National Secretary and the branches. The John Tomlinson Affair 1974 involved a radical social worker living in the Northern Territory, which is a remote area of Australia where many Indigenous Australians and communities live. John Tomlinson defied ministerial instructions and organised for a seven-year-old Indigenous girl who had been removed at birth to be taken from white foster carers and returned to her natural parents. As a result of that action, Tomlinson was very controversially demoted following a departmental inquiry which found him guilty of refusing orders from the federal minister and misleading the director of the welfare branch. In January 1974, the six social workers, again a very small number, employed by the Department of Aboriginal Affairs in the Northern Territory called the first ever social work strike in Australia to protest his demotion from acting regional social worker to base grade social worker. That strike was supported by the Northern Territory branch of the AASW, although the National ASW, which at the time was still a registered industrial union, adopted a more ambivalent approach, warning that, quote, such strikes can create employer resistance and destroy professional reputation, unquote. Nevertheless, the national membership of the association contributed over three thousand, uh, uh, sorry, over three hundred dollars to a fighting fund 
established to assist the strikers. Social workers and the stolen generations of Aboriginal children. A number of commentators have argued that professional social workers participated directly or at least indirectly by their professional silence in the forcible removal of thousands of Indigenous children from their families by Australian governments, estimated at between one in three and one in 10 children from 1910 to 1970. And that, that episode, that very dark episode is, is known as the Stolen Generations. So, to give one example, um, social work academic Bindi Bennett and her colleagues argue that social workers or people known as social workers played a major role in developing Indigenous welfare policies and practices that involved instruments of social control. According to Bennett and her colleagues, those practices provoke significant distrust and suspicion of social workers within, within many Indigenous families and communities historically. Understanding the precise nature of that relationship historically between social workers and the stolen generations is dependent though on a number of contested interpretations and definitions. Firstly, are we talking only about qualified social workers who were members of the AASW in that period? Or, <clears throat> excuse me, are we talking about anybody who called themselves a social worker or a welfare officer in that historical period? As I've already alluded to, it seems that few, if any, of the persons employed in child welfare departments in Australia prior to the 1970s had professional social work education or training. Secondly, do Indigenous communities historically or today distinguish between qualified social workers and other welfare personnel working in child protection services? And thirdly, does the term stolen generations only refer to that period when Indigenous children were removed without any legal accountability by police and other welfare authorities? Or does it also include the continuing large scale removal by professional child protection authorities of large numbers of Indigenous children? To date, Indigenous children, even in 2022, are removed at 11 times the rate for non-Indigenous children, forming 41% today of the total Australian out-of-home care population. If we only refer to qualified social workers from 1910 to 1970, then the evidence for social work complicity seems mostly hidden and partial at best. And in the official Bringing Them Home report written in 1997 about the stolen generations, there are actually very few references to social workers. So later in 1975, the AASW split into two, into a new trade union called the Australian Social Welfare Union, and a weakened professional association, which concentrated on professional education and accreditation issues. In part because of that split, there was very little commitment by the AASW to social action or reform over the following decades. Nevertheless, during that period, there was increasing criticism by emerging Indigenous child welfare organisations concerned at the growing and ever increasing overrepresentation of Indigenous children in out of home care, who were specifically critical of the role played by social workers in child welfare policy and practice, because by then, social workers had become the dominant group, without doubt, in government child welfare departments throughout Australia that were responsible for that large scale removal and placement of Indigenous children into out of home care. 
A further tension existed around the tight qualifications and eligibility eligibility for AASW membership. And in that earlier period, very few Indigenous social work practitioners were able to gain the university social work degree necessary for membership. It was not until about the mid 1980s that most Indigenous practitioners were able to move into university degrees. The final period from 1997 up to 2022, up to today, that period has seen a much greater AASW engagement with Indigenous Affairs, particularly following the release of that 1997 Bringing Them Home report. There has also, there has been a number of supportive policy statements by the AASW. There has been inclusion of Indigenous concerns in significant AASW practice and education documents and attempts to promote Indigenous participation in AASW affairs. And the turning point does seem to have been that 1997 Bringing Them Home report, which resulted from the official government inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. So the ASW presented a submission to that inquiry at, which acknowledged the role social workers had played in the removal of Indigenous children. And that, that statement is there in the PowerPoint, which makes a very full and, and um, very straightforward um, apology to Indigenous communities for that involvement. Now, not only that, the AASW also co-signed a statement of apology issued at that time by the Peak National Community Welfare Body, the Australian Council of Social Service. And that statement noted that, quote, we feel a particularly, particular sense of responsibility for the consequences of those racist policies because their implementation required the active involvement of community welfare organisations. So since that time, the AASW has been active in promoting reconciliation with Indigenous Australians and advancing culturally responsive practice. Some of the significant actions include a statement acknowledging the strength of Indigenous culture. They have completed three updated reconciliation action plans from 2013 to 2022. They published revised codes of ethics in 1999 and 2010 and new practice standards in 2013, recognising the strength of Indigenous culture and urging, urging culturally responsive practice in education. They have enhanced Indigenous content in the Australian Social Work Journal and the national newsletter Social Work Focus. Uh, there has been invitations to prominent Indigenous social workers to address national conferences, and they now reserve a board position for an Indigenous member. But to, to this day, there still are continuing tensions between the AASW and Indigenous Australians, including Indigenous social workers. There are still some barriers to Indigenous social workers participating in the AASW, and it is debatable whether or not professional initiatives such as the current AASW campaign for registration of social workers in Australia, which is finally making some progress, ade adequately consider the needs of Indigenous social workers and service users. So I guess to sum up, it is arguable that whilst progress has been made, uh, more does need to be done in terms of effectively implying cultural responsiveness and developing what we might call a fully decolonised social work practice. Uh, there are some references there in the PowerPoint. And um, I guess to close off, there, there is a slightly longer version of this paper, which I would be very pleased to share with anybody that would like it. So I'll 
wrap up there, hopefully roughly within time, Philip. Thank you for keeping perfectly to time, Philip, and, and thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, it gives me great pleasure um, next to introduce uh, Professor Ms. Beddo, who's Professor of Social Work at the University of Auckland. Uh, she's practiced in social work health settings uh, between 1978 and 91, was executive officer of the Aotearoa New Zealand Association of Social Workers from 1990 to 96, and was appointed to the inaugural Social Work Registration Board in 2003-6. Her research interests include critical perspectives on social work, education, supervision, professionalization, and professional identity. Uh, Liz, uh, we're so pleased that you're able to join us. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Philip, and, um, and thank you for everyone for organising this. It's a wonderful opportunity to see um, some familiar faces, but also lots of new faces. So thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Oops. There we go. So it's always hard to, to try and capture uh, such profound historical events that happen in our professions um, in a short space of time. And I, I really want to thank Philip um, for his uh, you know, brilliant overview of, us, of the history of relations with Indigenous Australians. I think it's really great. And I think what I've got to say builds on that a little bit, um, though I, I also looked at some different aspects. So um, I think for me, um, I decided that I would focus a little bit on education, but in doing so, it's impossible to mention all the other aspects of the sort of journey of our profession. So I talked about building a professional in contested territories, because I think often, um, having been both a practitioner, but also an educator now for about, oh gosh, 25 years or more, that um, that often the, 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 a real strong site of sort of contestation is in social work education because we are charged with that kind of generating the next, um, the next tranche of social workers to implement um, policy, to, to work with the issues of the day. So, so that contestation is often quite acute in the education settings. Um, so the challenges to, to social work, I'm just going to move the gallery out of the way, this is always the problem, as we know from many hours of, of online teaching, um, you know, social work arrived in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand as part of the Western project, it's, it's a colonial practice, um, it, it arrived um, in bits and pieces, it, it wasn't really established probably until the 60s, it, the, the, the first kind of social workers were employed both at, in the existing education department very much focused on child welfare and the other major site for social work initially was in um, in health and health settings um, social work emerged out of the sort of almana practices and then um, increasingly in the NGO sector the thing I think this distinguished our history of social work um, in New Zealand is the thing that actually uh, makes um, Aotearoa the country that it is which is because we have a foundational document, a treaty, a treaty that um, was signed um, two versions, which makes it very contestable, um, between Indigenous um, people of Aotearoa, the Māori people, and the British Crown. Now, the, the reason I mentioned two versions is the two versions um, are not the same. They're not the same. And so the understandings of uh, the Crown and the understandings of Indigenous people were different about what this meant in terms of things like sovereignty and leadership and, um, and those um, debates continue on into this day. So our history as a social work profession reflects that it can't escape that um, foundational um, treaty and the and the dispute and what what that treaty created, but also what has been left undone, the injustices that continued because despite the treaty, um, Indigenous people, Maori people, um, became the negative stat statistics. And and, and I'm, I'm I'm not going to focus particularly on that. I want to focus on the, the changes that we've been making over time. But still, in 2022, the um, the, the history is played out in the 
uh, stark uh, social problems of poverty, um, inequality, particularly say in disparities in the health setting, um, significant um, disadvantages for Māori and but also for Pacific people um, in Aotearoa in terms of health status, expected, you know, um, life uh, course, you know, participation in education in, in many different ways. Um, there are these in, inbuilt inequalities that we try every day to, to challenge and to create change. So social work couldn't escape from any of that. Um, we can't escape either from our relationship with government. Much of what we do is funded either directly or indirectly by government, which means we can't, while we want to be often independent of the political aspect of government, we know that policy plays out because government ministers have agendas, and we've seen that a time and time again in our profession. Um, but we retain our strong commitment to social justice and human rights. Um, so I've given a kind of a selected timeline here. Um, gosh, I could have written about five pages of things in the timeline, but I thought, well, I'm going to have a little focus on education. So the first social work diploma was established at Victoria University in 1949, run by two um, British, I think, graduates of, of, of LSE who established the social work program, and that was it for quite a long time. Um, the first um, professional association was formed in 1964 in a journal not long after that. In 1972, there was a, statu a standalone statutory children's service established. Since then, it's had at least 25 restructures and many, many name changes. Again, a common factor that we'd see around um, many of the countries that are that are where people are represented from today, that sort of constant change, constant tinkering with child welfare services. Um, and although social work is probably about only about 25% of our social workers in New Zealand work in that service, many more work with children and families in the NGO sector. And the NGO sector is largely funded by large contracts with government, as well as charitable funding and um, philanthropic funding. In the 1980s, degree qualifications were added to the National Diploma. I had to say the National Diploma was very much modelled on the early UK qualifications, and there are still some aspects of our social work um, qualifications and the expectations of what's taught and how placements are managed and that kind of thing that reflect the old um, certificate of qualification in social work from the UK. It's sort of like it's it's almost like it's still there. Um, the, the ghost of the C CQSW is still there in some aspects of our qualifications. Um, I've, I've highlighted the development of the report Poao Te Atatū, which means daybreak, which was a major report on institutional racism in Aotearoa. That was sparked by the growing awareness of, of um, the, dis, the hugely disproportionate number of Māori children who were in state care, whether that was in, foster, in the foster care system or in institutions, and there were at that point still many institutional child, um, child welfare and, and, uh, and what we could now call youth justice, but um, settings for young people where they were in residential care. Um, the um, architect of that report, John Rangiho, who was himself a, a child welfare officer before this um, huge task was, was given to him, went around the country to Marae, which are community um, sort of uh, places of, of a huge significance in, in, the, in the many um, peoples of Aotearoa because Māori isn't one, uh, one uh, single um, identity. There are many, um, many, many iwi. Um, and, and he visited with a, a small um, committee all of, all of these marae and heard from people about the experiences they had with our state welfare system and produced a major report on institutional racism, which was to, to actually massively change um, the course of the development of the profession and particularly education over the next, um, the next number of years. Uh, we introduced um, family group conferences, 
1989, which we then seemed to export to the rest of the world. I have to say they were very, very different the way they were conducted in New Zealand because of the, the, the cultural expectations. Um, we developed um, a reg registration which was non-mandatory and that was introduced by a government because it was seen as a way of improving social work practice because there were, as there have been in many countries, cases that um, of, of uh, child deaths where social work was held accountable for failings in practice. So registration was meant to fix all this. Um, some of us were very cynical. I did go on the first registration board and was part of setting up the, some of the architecture for that. Um, it was an interesting experience. <laughs> Much has been written about that elsewhere if anybody is interested. Um, in 2016, our Social Workers Registration Board required us to offer either four-year BSWs or qualifying master's degrees. In that way, we're very similar to the system of education in Australia. And mandatory registration um, kicked in, in in 2020. So all social workers, now social work has protection of title and all social workers have to be registered. So I'm going to um, rapidly move along. Um, so what does all that mean in terms of the significance of our his, for our history? Um, and I'm, I want to cite here um, Leland Rufio, who is a, a significant Māori scholar of social work, who's currently working actually back in the in the world of um, having an his PhD and being a, an educator, has gone back into the um, corridors of power and, and, and working uh, to develop policy and practice and is currently really committed to developing what we call mana enhancing practice um, in New Zealand social work, particularly within the child welfare service, which is currently called oranga tamariki or the, the well-being of children. Um, Leland talks about three recognition points. And one of the things I've always liked about his work is he acknowledges the importance of history. We need to understand where we've been in order to know where we're going. Um, he also talks about that need to embed Māori um, theoretical concepts to underpin healing and restoration for Māori people. And I'm going to give you a few examples of, of those kinds of models in a, in a little while. Um, the Social Work Registration Board, right from the very beginning, was in the legislation was required to um, ensure competence to work with Māori people. And I've, I'm, I've only given you two um, important um, standards there, which will, will probably then sort of fall out into why we're doing what we're doing now. I'm not going to read all of these because I'm aware of the time pressure, but you can see there that this is this is how a social worker demonstrates competence in New Zealand with that first standard about being competent to work with Māori. So we start with the treaty, we start with language, with understanding tikanga, which is kind of culture and practice. Um, we, we need to really understand where we've come from. We need to respect um, cultural processes, cultural practice. We need to enhance the mana of people, which is about respecting and, and, and behaving in a way that is safe and respectful. We need to build um, care, practices of care. We need to meet our obligations and we need to, to practice in a way that sustains warm relationships and, and well-being in all of the ways that we work in social work. So that's a very strong set of requirements. And that's just one of the, of the, of the standards, but it's probably one of the ones that occupies our minds the most at the moment. So I'm not, um, again, going to talk to you. This is more just like a kind of a little visual journey of some of the things. This is a classic model, which is called Te Whare Tapa Whā. Um, and it the, 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 the house or the whare, the metaphor of the four walls, which is around the spiritual um, the aspects, the health, the physical aspects, the emotional and sort of connectedness aspects. And it's a really dominant metaphor for health and well-being in our profession. And every social work student would be taught this. There's another model, which is tefiki, which is the octopus, which again talks about, you see the similar words here, spirituality, um, cognition, the mind, well -being, physical well-being, extended family, the life force, the spiritual life force of people, um, our, everyone's unique identity, the, the, the breath of life that comes from 
the, the, our ancestors into our present and goes into our future and, and healthy um, emotions. Um, we also have seen develop a model for a pan-Pacific model of health um, that has also influences the way we teach students to think about working with Pacific peoples. So what next? Where do we go from here? This is such a rapid tour. Um, I think the things that are really significant for us going forward are that this is an, this is an ongoing project. This pro project doesn't it starts in a place of, of understanding our history, but it doesn't finish in a place because we take it forward into our future. We are still a very stratified country. We still have these incredible inequalities. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, and we are just very small cog in the wheel of making these changes, which as you can imagine are happening throughout Māori society, throughout New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand society, and are challenged by um, those who wish to maintain dominance for white people um, and Western and white ways of seeing the world. However, we, we, we have made some big changes in our curriculum, and that's something I'm involved in every day as a teacher. We have an increasing role of for Māori organisations in child protection that's changing as we speak, it's changing. We have increasing number of Māori um, health organisations. COVID has really challenged us to devolve a lot of services, particularly in the primary and public health areas to Māori. And we have a new Māori health authority that will be picking up responsibility for some very dramatic change. So it's a big journey we're on and we're all very excited about the changes we're making, but we don't in any way imagine that this is going to be easy and straightforward because it's often one or two steps forward and several steps back and if governments change then we can get that that winding back that happens so I just wanted to thank you um, and uh, share with you a couple of um, photographs of, of things in our beautiful country um, and to um, acknowledge um, who should have been with me on this talk as well, my, my very um, precious Māori colleagues who are always asked to do so many things and I'm very happy to have been able to, um, to, to do this um, on the behalf of all of us um, uh, and hopefully the next time um, you'll have a Māori speaker. So thank you. I've got, of course, references, and I'm very happy to uh, um, to stop sharing my screen. That's what I'm happy to do. And to, um, if anyone wants to contact me, I'm very happy to provide more information. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Liz, and, and thank you for keeping perfectly to time. Um, we we now have a, a joint presentation. Uh, from Dr. Uh, Tio Ai Kua, um, who is Senior Lecturer, the School of Applied Psychology, Social Work Policy um, at the University of Utara, Malaysia. Um, and uh, Tio's area of interest includes public social welfare services, professionalization of social work, case management, uh, and care in the community. And he was president of uh, the Malaysian Association of Social Work. And uh, speaking with him is Professor Fuzia Shafi, uh, who is professor of, uh, a professor at the School of Applied Psychology, Social Work and Policy, also at the University of Utara, uh, Malaysia. Um, uh, because he has studied in my, my hometown of, of Powell. Uh, it's very nice to see. Uh, she is a member of the Malaysian Association of Social Workers, the Asia Pacific Association of Social Work Education, and is also active, actively involved in the Malaysia Red Crescent Society. So thank you so much for joining us and, and over to you. Thank you, Professor Philip. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer for having us. Uh, I would like to send, uh, uh, convey the greetings and the apology from uh, Professor Sha uh, Fuzia Shafi because she has some, some matters to attend to and she's on the road. She's following the, the discussion, but she wouldn't be able to, to present. So she has asked me to, to, to present on, on 
the entirety of the of the of our presentation. So let me just uh, uh, share the my slides. Yeah. Okay. We can hope everybody can see the slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so my my topic, our topic is actually on social work uh, development in Malaysia, uh, and the historical uh, and and connection, history and connection with the Commonwealth. So my presentation, our presentation will be in three parts. One is that uh, how social work developed with the introduction of social welfare uh, before independence. Yeah, du uh, during the uh, the colonization, yeah, and then after, then what happened after independence, and then, uh, then lastly, I would like to compare, yeah, uh, the how social work has come, uh, come to today in, in Malaysia, and how is it different from the UK, and and what causes, yeah, that that to, uh, to happen. Okay. Okay. So just a brief, a quick. Uh, brief background yeah of Malaysia for you know for the audience who are not uh, who are not uh, familiar with Malaysia yeah so for Malaysia is Malaysia is, is uh, can be divided into two two uh, territory one is the Peninsula Malaysia yeah and another one is uh, the region of Sabah Sarawak yeah so uh, actually the the colonization doesn't happen you know in in uh, at the same time in in all the parts of Malaya or Malaysia yeah so it it took almost a hundred uh, couple of 50 years yeah for the British to to uh, eventually yeah uh, 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 colonize uh, Malaysia uh, but before yeah before World War two yeah uh, actually we were divided in three okay three categories yeah the straight settlement which is uh, which my hometown Penang is one of it yeah and actually Penang is uh, was the first uh, territory being decolonized in 1786 by the British um, uh, so they have the Penang, we have Melaka, and uh, Singapore at that time, and you have the federal federated Malay states, which is yellow, yeah, four states, and then the unfederated Malay states, which is in blue, and then of course you have Sabah and Sarawak, which is quite unique because they were not directly under the the the, the British colony, what they called the same administration, okay, it was owned by by other companies, yeah. Uh, Eventually, we, we gained independence from uh, from uh, from the British in 1957. At that time, it's the independence of Malaya, which is the peninsula. And then in 1963, we had the formation of Malaysia with Sabah, Sarawak, and also Singapore joining. And Singapore separated from Malaysia in 1965. So that is the, uh, a very brief historical back background of Malaysia. Okay, so before, yeah, even before, uh, uh, how social welfare or social so, social welfare services were introduced, yeah, uh, because of the uh, you know different time, yeah, different time of the rule, the British rules in, in different states, yeah. So the earliest, yeah, the earliest uh, uh, services that we could uh, find, yeah, uh, that is being written down is actually the appointment of the protectorate of the Chinese, okay, in Singapore, yeah. Uh, basically, they are protecting women and girls who are being uh, being uh, trafficked, okay, to to Singapore, to the uh, to Malaya, yeah, uh, to satisfy the 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 uh, sexual needs of the uh, migrant workers, mainly from China, yeah, during during those times. So, uh, so the British have already uh, at that time appointed yeah the protectors of Chinese in, in Singapore. So to, to make sure that they protect, they can protect, they set up uh, facilities to protect the women and girls traffic in, into uh, uh, Singapore, Penang, Kuala Lumpur, and Malacca. Yeah, so they set up uh, those facilities. And then uh, in 1912, uh, a labor department was set up in several states, basically to manage labor, you know, because for, uh, for Malaysia, before independence, uh, uh, mainly uh, in tin mining, the, the, the economic uh, sector was uh, booming that time was the the uh, tin mining and also the rubber estates so the british has uh, uh, brought in yeah has brought in uh, many migrant workers from china and from india yeah so they set up a labor department to look into the welfare of uh, the, the migrant workers there 
And then in 1937, it was recorded that there's, there's a Department of Social Service. Okay? And the manpower were mainly from the UK, those who are trained in social work from London School of Economics. Yeah? So, uh, so, but it was, it was uh, what do you call, uh, not comprehensive. Yeah? So it's catered for certain places, not all uh, over the country. Yeah, so, so that was before World War II. Okay, so after the war, yeah, I'm not talking about what happened in, uh, during the war, yeah, during the Japanese occupation. Yeah, it's just that after the war, the British returned. Okay, and of course, they have to face with uh, the, 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 the consequences of, of, of the situation yeah, uh, after the war. So the British set up the, the Department of Social Welfare Malaya. Okay, so for the first time, uh, we have a central agencies okay that looks into the social welfare not by the states anymore but the central one yeah so the immediate response yeah was setting up public restaurants and also uh, uh providing a relief scheme for the those uh, victims okay those who have uh, uh brought by the japanese to build the railway in in in, in burma yeah so they return and then they were you know they were out of job they were uh, homeless so these are all the uh, the what they call the schemes of uh, services you provided yeah so basically to provide a public as, uh, assistance okay so interestingly yeah uh, in even in the the official records of uh, of the department of social welfare uh until today many of them uh, many of the publication has uh, uh, mentioned that uh, dr cp rawson as the first uh, chief social welfare officer of Malaya, okay, in 1947. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, Professor uh, Buzia Shafi, in her, uh, when she did her study on, on the uh, child welfare uh, during the British administration, she found out that actually there's one Mr. J. Harvey who was appointed as the first, uh, as the acting chief social welfare officer. Okay. Um, um, why Harvey was appointed as an acting and not the first? Okay, that was the question. Uh, okay, raised by uh, Professor uh, Shahi, uh, Professor Fuzia. Okay, uh, my guess. Okay, we are still looking into it. Is that probably because uh, Harvey was uh, was an administrator? He has been uh, posted in, in Malaya. Okay, for uh, since nineteen twenty five. So, but he is not. He was not trained in social work. He, he was not a social worker. Yeah. So I think. My belief is that uh, Dr. C.P. Rawson, he was a graduate from the London School of Economics uh, and he was a trained social, uh, social workers. So that's why uh, they waited until uh, C.P. Rawson is available and that he was appointed as the, the first social, chief social welfare officer of Malaya yeah, from 1947 to 1952. And it was uh, Dr. Rawson who introduced the social welfare casework management, uh, all the social work uh, uh, skills and, and, and uh, methods in in the welfare of uh, department of social welfare and it was a huge it was during his time as well uh, he started probation service children's services and protection services for women and girls so if you look at the time okay uh, there is much of the that was also yeah uh, the the what you call the the main uh, services provided in the uk yeah um it was also dr rawson who brought Okay, who recommended that the, the, the local staffs that have been recruited? Yeah, because at that time, Malaysia, we don't have any universities. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Rosen has recommended that for the staff to get their social work training uh, at London School of Economics. Okay, so, so they were sent. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this shortly. Yeah, okay. So the second uh, 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 chief social welfare officer of Malaya was uh, Mr. JC McDowell. Yeah, uh, from 1950. Due to 1907. So when we gained independence in 1907, all the chief social welfare officers were held by the locals. Yeah. And in 1961, the position of the chief social welfare officers was changed to director general of social welfare, which is used until today. Yeah. Okay. So the department of social welfare started as a department. Okay. And it maintained the department stature. Okay. Although the uh, subsequently the government introduced ministry. Okay, so the Department of Social Welfare is one of the agencies in, within the ministry. So he has changed, he has changed names under different ministries yeah, in the early days. The Ministry of Industry, Social Relations, Health and Social Welfare, Labor, Health, and then Labor again. Yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it shows okay, the, uh, the thinking 
of the uh, government of the early days because where to position, okay? How to position social welfare within the needs of the country, okay? So until 1964, when the, the government decided that, okay, uh, we have a Ministry of Welfare and then in 1982 changed to a Ministry of Social Welfare where it's a single agency, yeah? That provides social welfare services. That, uh, that was the, to us, to many of us, it's like a, a golden era of social welfare because after that in 1990, starting from 1990, the government look at social welfare as a tool mm -hmm. for national unity. Okay, so they were put under the Ministry of Nationality and Community Development. So economic development, community development, and nationality are the, 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 the what they call the priority of the government. Yeah. And then in 2004, uh, the Department of Social Welfare put under the Ministry of Women, Family, and Community Development until today. Yeah, until today. Okay, so uh, just uh, I was looking into how, you know, uh, how social welfare was introduced to, to Malaya, okay, as a, 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 as a British colony. Yeah? So I was looking into what happened in the British, okay, at the same time. So as I, th I think, uh, I think uh, uh, colleagues from, from the UK would, would know very well, yeah, the, the idea of a welfare state yeah, was uh, brought by the Labour government yeah, when they, they, they uh, came into power after like, World War II, yeah, through the, uh, so they have pledged, okay, to establish a welfare state. And that also uh, influenced the post-war colonial uh, uh, policy. Okay, uh, so, uh, so it's no longer looking into the, the economic, yeah? Because the colonial, uh, all the, 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 the country, other countries under the colonization was basically, you know, for economic factors, okay? For economic purpose. But with, with the new labor government then, they are started to look into how to provide a better standards of life. Yeah. So in the so I think there's a white paper on the organization of the colonial service, yeah, uh, in 1946, which you know uh, basically uh, trying to get more locals coming into the public service, okay, for countries who are preparing for independence. Okay. So 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 I think what the 1946 white paper, yeah, the, the common paper uh, 197 is one one of the policy that influenced uh, how the British introduced social welfare, uh, at least in Malaya, okay, and Singapore. Okay, uh, so in 1948, yeah, uh, uh, because in, in, in the, uh, what you call, uh, uh, the, the British and, and the, uh, uh, the people of Malaya, Malaya then had an had a agreement, yeah, what sort of entity, okay, that the country would moving forward. Yeah? So they agreed on a federation of uh, Malaya Agreement, the FMA, which, which, uh, uh, although we have gained independence, but the impact is that, okay, the Malaya, uh, the federal constitution and our political uh, development is basically focused on a strong central government service. So health, education, social welfare, they are all central government service. Okay, uh, so is that different? Yeah, as as uh, so I, I I was looking into you know. Uh, the differences in, in the UK and the and, and Malaysia and Malaysia then is that because in, in, in the UK you have the CBOM report in 1968, which you know actually placing social work at the local government. Okay. While uh, Malaysia maintained that social welfare service is the central government service. So today, yeah, if you go to uh, if you need social welfare service, you go to the social welfare office at the district level. But the manpower Okay, the recruitment, the training, the policies are all federal from the central government. Okay, so uh, just now I, mean, I mentioned about uh, Dr. C.P. Rawson, yeah? So when the locals were recruited, yeah, uh, they were sent to do the training. It's a two-year course, yeah? two-year two -year certificate. Yeah? So they were sent in 1946, four were sent to, to, to do their training in, in, at the London School of Economics. In 47, there are two. In 1948, there are five. And one of them, uh, I want to highlight that is the uh, one Mr. S. Sokanadan. Uh, after, after he was uh, graduated from, from, from UK, and then she came, uh, he came back and continued to serve the department until he was promoted to become the first trained social workers to be appointed as a teacher of social welfare. Yeah, because after uh, uh, Mr. Uh, McDowell, okay, the the DG, uh, the Director General of Social Welfare, was helped by non-social work uh, 
uh, but non-social workers, mainly of administrators. So Mr. Sokol Nadan was the first local uh, social worker to be appointed as the DG. Yeah? And, and subsequently, all the DGs will uh, have some, some, some sort of social work education yeah? in, in the training. Okay. So the, on social work education, uh, uh, in 1952, yeah, uh, there, was a, there was a diploma in social studies, yeah? part one, which is a two years program introduced at the School of Applied Social Studies at the University of Malaya, okay? At the time, University of Malaya was in Singapore, yeah? And in 1957, they introduced the part two, which is additional one year, which is actually meant for medical social workers, yeah? So social workers at the, the social welfare service uh, established in 1946, yeah? Uh, the almoners or hospital social workers were introduced in 1952, okay? At the big hospitals. So the... Interestingly, yeah, when, when we look into the, the uh, read into the, the history of the social program, okay, started at University of Malaya in Singapore. Okay, uh, Miss Robertson, yeah, it was a social workers trained in the UK, and then uh, Jane Robbins Robertson. Then before she worked in Australia, and then back to UK, and then to New Zealand, and then subsequently he was she was asked to to lead, yeah, to become the uh, to become the uh, the first uh, director or first. Uh, Principal of the School of uh, Applied Social Studies at University of Malaya. So, what uh, Ms. Robertson wrote that is that the social program uh, was not modeled on any overseas curriculum. Okay, neither British nor American. Okay, so, so she was quite adamant that the program, okay, is designed for the local needs. Okay, so and and because of that, it's also served as an in-service training. Yeah for the social welfare cadets officers then, yeah? Okay, so we have our first program in 1975, yeah, UC Science Malaysia. So it was a, from diploma, when we have our first program in, in Malaysia, yeah, after independence, it was in the degree, okay? So we offer a degree, okay? Uh, I think in for UK then, it was still looking at the postgraduate certificate or postgraduate diploma, yeah? And it was the, the recommendation from the UN, yeah, UN, uh, uh, International Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East, yeah. So, uh, so basically, the education, yeah, from from uh, uh, from from Malaysia, uh, social education in Malaysia, different from the UK from then from then onwards, yeah, is no longer at the diploma, no longer at the postgraduate diploma, but as a degree, yeah. Okay, just out. Because of time factor, I just skip yeah, some of the uh, uh, information on the uh, on the location of the universities. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what are the connections? Yeah, many of our social welfare officers was okay. Although they were not sent for to the UK or Commonwealth to do their first degree, okay, or qualification in social work, but many of them still sent to the UK to do policy studies, social planning at the postgraduate level. Yeah. So. Almost half, yeah, from my from my study, almost half of the uh, social well, the, the, uh, the director of social well, director general of social welfare, uh, obtained their postgraduate studies in the UK, yeah, and uh, many of social educators also obtained their postgraduate degree, yeah, either masters or PhD from UK, Australia, and Singapore, yeah. So we were formed, yeah, uh, the Malaysia Association of Social Workers were formed in nineteen seventy three, okay, and uh, sorry. Uh, I, there's some typo here. Okay, actually in 1975, MASW joined the Malaysian Professional Center, which is actually a professional body, umbrella uh, organization representing professionals in, in, in Malaysia. And the interestingly, the Malaysian Professional Center was actually set up using the funding from the Commonwealth Foundation in 1973, sorry, yeah? So there's some, some typo there. Okay, and then, okay, I think, uh, I think my, my time is, <laughs> is up. Okay, let, let me go, go to yeah, some of the, uh, you can read about this, yeah. Uh, our Malaysian social workers were involved in in, uh, in in setting up the Commonwealth Organization for Social Work, yeah, Anthony Chan. Uh, we have engaged yeah, uh, uh, social work uh, educators from, uh, a consultant from Australia to start on our social practice competency standards, yeah, in post 2004. And we have some exchanges, yeah, with, within the Commonwealth, with Australia, with India, yeah, uh, let me just conclude. Yeah, the, my, my last slide. Yeah, uh, that just to recap. Yeah, so the, the differences are social welfare service. Yeah, social service in, in UK is at the local level. Malaysia is still a centralized uh, 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 service. 
for the policy, I think UK has a very strong policy and you have a constant review. Yeah, so, so many reports, whether you like it or not, you agree to or not, there's an impact on, on the direction of the, the, the profession. However, the, the policy review, there's no re regular policy review, okay? And they are not impacting on social work per se because they are more looking into uh, uh, how, to uh, how to develop a more self-related to the, uh, uh, what they call resilient uh, caring society. So the government would like people to self-help. They encourage voluntarism, not so much of de developing the professional social work. Uh, so of course, social uh, UK has already have a strong recognition. We are still working on it. Yeah. Uh, uh, and post two thousand four, we are uh, moving towards that, and and we are still uh, working on those our social professional view. Yeah, so this is something which I, with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Tia. Welcome, welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, for our first presentation uh, of the, after the break, uh, we have two speakers. One is going to speak via recorded video, Baju uh, Vari who is assistant professor in the School of Social Work at McCune University in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Um, but before uh, Baju, um, Fazlu Rahman is going to be speaking live. Uh, Fazlu is a PhD student at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. And uh, he previously worked as a junior social worker at uh, the Sri Chita uh, Thinal Institute of Medical Sciences and Technology. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Fazlu. So Fazlu, please, uh, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Shall I scare? That's great. Okay. Uh, shall I start, sir? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The slides uh, are clear. Sure. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would express my gratitude to the conference organizers for providing me with this opportunity to present my paper. And uh, please forgive me if you feel any difficulties in understanding my English pronunciation. Please, again. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, for a better understanding, uh, uh, my, my presentation has two parts. Uh, the first part, I will discuss on brief history of development of professional social work in India. The second part, I will discuss uh, Mahatma Gandhi's contribution to the development of professional social work across the world. So when we examine the global history of social work, we see that its origin may be traced back to universal values such as humanism, rationalism, welfareism, liberalism, democracy, secularism, and utilitarianism. Uh, selfish interest and human misery coexisted in societies throughout the world alongside concern for the poor. The evolution of social work has influenced charity, social reform, and social welfare services from local rulers, kings, kings, landlords, foreign congress, and elected governments throughout the world. Also, religion and philanthropists provide humanitarian assistance to reduce people's suffering. When coming to the history of social work in India, uh, we can uh, see that a strong moral and spiritual values have been part of Indian tradition since the beginning of the Vedic period. Uh, the seeds of human development have been sown since the dawn of Indian society. The spirit of community service was manifested in many different areas of life and inspired individuals and organized groups in the community. Uh, religions such as Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, and Buddhism uh, originated the Indian subcontinent the qualitative ideas of this religion have become an inseparable part of the development of Indian social work. The idea of nonviolence, universal brotherhood, compassion, respect, honesty, voluntary services, uh, and many more beneficial ideas and philosophies of this religion can also be found in the principles and ethics of contemporary professional social work. Uh, we cannot uh, go apart without reflecting the contribution of the development of professional social work 
uh, by, without the um, uh, representation of colonial rulers in India. Europeans had established their companies in India by the end of the 15th century. The arrival of colonial rulers changed the entire terrain of India. And it was made up of Portuguese, the Englishers, and Dutch and French companies. India's societal, economic, administrative, and legal system saw significant change when colonial power was established. Education, social welfare, women empowerment, health, agricultural, infrastructure development are all benefited from colonial rule. That, were, that way, the professional social work began to take root in India, following the footstep of professional social work in Europe and the United States. With the arrival of colonial rule, Western education began in India, and many Indian intellectuals traveled to West for further their studies. After finishing their studies, they returned to India and became involved in social and develop, India's social development and national movements. In India, it produced leaders with a solid intellectual foundation. These intellectuals, Indian academicians, and social reformers spoke against India's existing social inequalities, injustice, and immoralities. As a result of social reform movement, high level of philosophical ideas and theories evolved. Many of these ideas and philosophies went throughout the world and became role model for many others. Uh, when we discussing uh, these kind of yeah. philosophies, the Gandhian Gandhian philosophy is one such idea that spread all over the world. The, this study, we, we are coming to the second part of my presentation. This study mainly focuses on how the ideas derived from the life of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the father of the nation of India, are related to the professional social work of the world, or how his philosophical thought contributed to the development of social work. Gandhi's ideas are geared to serving others and pursuing social justice complement to the theory of social work practice. His method based on a combination of social service and social action. Gandhian principles are predicted to a set of philosophical beliefs such as cooperation over competition, interdependence over regular individualism, compassion for others over pursuit of self-interest and social justice or social justice over individual achievement. Now we analyze how the following Gandhian philosophies contribute to the development of professional social work. We are just discussing the three philosophies that is ahimsa, that is means non-violence, satyagraha, that is social action for social integration, and sarvodaya, which means welfare for all. Uh, coming to the ahimsa, ahimsa is one of the greatest vision of Mahatma Gandhi has offered to the world. Simply, it means non-violence. As part of its universal recognition of this great ideology, the United Nations has designated October 2 the Gandhi's birthday as International Day of Nonviolence since 2007. According to Mahatma Gandhi, nonviolence encompasses not simply nonviolence or harm, but also mental purification through the body, speech, and mind, as well as state of good acts. Nonviolence and I perceiving others as a good and kind, and everyone possesses the inner resources to seek out others' compassion and understanding. Gandhi of nonviolence emphasizes maintaining a genuine and non hypocritical relationship with the society and the individual in all matters. Love, kindness, and honesty should act as a bridge between the two. We can observe the practical application of Gandhi's theory in professional social work. Gandhi idea can be help a client worker relationship function at its best. The client worker connection, according to Gandhi, should be it should be remain close, non exploitative, honest, non manipulative, and genuine. This is a relationship which self-evaluation takes place and monitors. Nonviolence is a means of ensuring social justice by surviving, by serving people in need. Providing service allows a person to achieve ultimate self-satisfaction, personal growth, and life of rich compassion. Uh, as a result, the Gandhian concept opposes the widespread belief that social service exhausts individual. In fact, Gandhian philosophy stand along with the professional social work. The next philosophy it is Satyagraha, that is uh, social action. Satyagraha is the social action philosophy by Mahatma Gandhi, emphasizing on his idea of nonviolence. From the history of Indian freedom struggle to the contemporary social movement, it is indebted to the Gandhiji's ideas of Satyagraha. Gandhi's concept of Satyagraha gave ideological impulse to many of the successful struggle of professional social workers in India. Therefore, the history of professional social work in India is highly indebted to the Gandhi's idea of Satyagraha. In the broadest sense, Satyagraha is hold fast to the truth. Satyagraha is a social action philosophy that provides an opportunity for dialogue and response in the language of truth and respect to the adversary. To ensure a desired social change or social justice, 
not through violence or aggression. Nonviolence is a fundamental basis of Satyagraha. Credibility building, legitimization, dramatization, multiple strategy, dual strategy, and manifold program that emphasized in the social action method in professional social work can all be found in Gandhi Satyagraha in a more practical way. Moreover, Gandhi's idea of social action include self-discipline, self-sufficiency, and spirituality. When we observe Gandhi Satyagraha, the principal techniques are closely related to the social action in professional social work that we practice. Then Sarvodaya, Sarvodaya, which means welfare for all. The, the blueprint of Gandhi's community development model is the concept of Sarvodaya. Sarvodaya means the welfare of all. In developing this principle, he drew much from the John Rusk book, Unto the Last. The, the word Sarvodaya means first aid to the poorest of the poor. Therefore, there is a general need of serve others and a special moral obligation to first serve those in the greatest need. Gandhi trained Indian villages to achieve self-sufficiency by embracing the dignity of brotherhood and mutual cooperation beyond any caste, creed, language, or place of birth. He says any work has its dignity. The Sodeshi movement was part of it. Gandhi envisioned sustainable community development through the concept of Sarvodaya. It's closely related to the community development practice in professional social work. We have a National Association of Social, work, uh, social Workers on Social Welfare. They uh, uh, define, they say, social workers should promote the general welfare of society from local to global level and the development of people, their communities, and their environment. Social workers should advocate for living conditions conducive to the fulfillment of basic human needs and should promote social, economic, political, and cultural values and institutions that are compatible with the realization of social justice. It is just the replication of Gandhi's idea which he propagated. Come to the end, the conclusion. Uh, Gandhi has been described as a pragmatic idealist, a heuristic social practitioner of high moral standard established in the wisdom and spiritual philosophy. Gandhi's system was similar to social work, including concern about racial, gender, and class justice, empowerment of the people, overcoming the poverty, and development of a culture that promotes healthy human development. If we do a closer analysis of the existing ethical principles of professional social work today that we practice, it will clearly precipitate the Gandhian philosophies and ideas. In another way, we can say that the Gandhian principles are inseparable from the idea of professional social work. I believe the Gandhian, the Gandhian philosophies and principles contributed to the development of contemporary social work in the world in general and India in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so now, um, shall we play the, uh, the video presentation? Hello. Welcome everyone to my presentation on teaching of others, influence of Euro-American systems in social work education in India. I'm very happy to do this presentation in the conference on uh, comparative histories of the development of social work across the Commonwealth. My name is Baiju Barid. I'm a faculty in the social work program at McEwan University in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. The presentation will share my observations, learning, and experience of social work education and teaching in India and Canada, and reflect upon how the colonial history of the West has influenced education of social work in India. There has been a criticism about social work education in India by several authors that social work education and practice in India has been adopting Western concepts and practice models and it also fails to devise indigenous strategies for social work practice which is significant to Indian context. Even though there is universality of social work principles, say for example, empathy, and social work practice models, working with individuals, groups, and communities, the way they work are different in different communities based upon the cultural, historical, socio-economic, religious, power structure of societies. But unfortunately, 
the way social work education has been developed in india is mostly based on the western concepts <clears throat> very interestingly even the formation of a social work program a social work school in india is based on colonial relationship to refer to one other the main initiative for the establishment of the first school of professional social work in india which was which is presently the titan institute of social work in mumbai that was established in 1996 it was known as sir the rabji titan institute of social sciences when it was established it was undertaken by an american missionary clifford manshat who had their social work experience both in america and india and that person was the first director of the school and when we say the experience of social work from america that is predominantly west second that person was a missionary and the word missionary also has implications related to the colonialism the religious context the ethics they follow in social work education very interestingly moving on we'll find even the specializations offered for social work education in india had their beginning by the people who had their experience from the west medical psychiatry social work family and child welfare correctional administration level welfare were introduced by the visiting faculties from the us universities when i started to teach social work and learn more about social work education in india i was wondering why do we have a specialization on labor welfare for social work education in india which is not available as a specialization in many parts of the world and that is how the social work relationship to the industrial and capitalistic sector is understood or social work education was initially started by one of the most reputed industrial firms in india the tata group social work education also spread into various metro cities which had lots of industries so labor welfare is still one of the largest specialization in social work education in india which of course is significant but that is very specific to the industrial needs and you will find that that is not part of the core of social work education when compared to other parts of the world so critically looking looking at the origin of social work education and the various specializations and programs involved in it you find it they have been started not indigenous people or not people from india who had the experience of the problems in the country and the strategies and methodologies to address them but it was people who who came from west and started it well india has a history of colonialism and colonialism has contributed and influenced many sectors including education so this could be read along with that one but the critical understanding on the origin of social work education in india will give us some more clarity on how the western methodologies have challenged or have not been sufficiently enough to address the context of social work practice in india to refer to one of the examples what you see here is a definition of community organization by murray jiros and this definition is one when i studied for my social work degree about like 25 years back and this is the same definition i was teaching for um, social work programs when i was teaching in india for about 15 years and i was talking to my colleagues back in india about this definition and they said yeah, they are teaching the definition the same definition well this definition is by a canadian author murray jiros 
and he was not a social worker he was involved in community activities then he compiled uh, a reference kind of reference text for community workers based upon his missionary work while well, he later became the president of a university in in canada he was a well known uh, sociologist and his text was actually published in 1958 even though reference given his for 1964 so the definition of community organization that i studied and been still taught in many of the institutions in india is of muraji ros which was developed like about 70 years back when i moved into canada 10 years back and i had been teaching social courses and community work then i was looking to yeah there should be we should be referring to muraji ros and i was looking for where is muraji ros in the literature of community organization in canada i could never find his name so the definition has changed a lot Uh, the concept of community work has changed a lot since 1950s or after but many of the literature that we follow in indian social work education is still clinging on to the very uh, previous or very old definitions or literature in other ways the advancement of social work literature in other parts of the world is not sufficiently reaching to the indian context and there is in sufficient understanding and reproduction of the knowledge as required to the local context in the country uh, so to summarize this argument the social work curriculum in india also followed the methods and techniques offered by colonizers and international agencies and we have been heavily dependent upon textbook from western countries most american to social work programs and they perhaps may not be fitting to all realms of practice in india well a simplest context is the social work problems addressed by social workers in western countries and india or other parts of the commonwealth are different poverty and related is are still dominate many of the social work uh social development issues in india as well as other countries and india has some very unique problems structural factors like casteism issues of governance patriarchy whereas the examples the methodologies the strategies the philosophies discussed most in western literature are specific to the context of those countries so adapting them to indian context may not be perfectly fitting and this is one challenge where the west is actually missing the reality of india as well as other well countries one more thing i wanted to highlight is how history of india and other countries is missing in the west this is the picture of a Chanakya or Atharvas Manas Kaudilya who has authored Artha Shastra which is supposed to be a, one of the most important document on governance uh, in the prehistorical periods. I was teaching a course on human rights practice and social justice for bachelor's program one year back. And there was one book authored by an American professor which we used as a reference book for text and it has a history on human rights in india which was referring to human rights histories in different parts of the world it talks about the magna carta different um, milestones in the evolution of human rights in european and american history and no reference about artha shastra no reference about the human rights perspective in the rulings of various dynasties in india or in china or in africa or even among the indigenous communities in the in america which very clearly shows the entire knowledge taught in social work is been developed by few people and it's mostly white people in this very limited geographical space of the universe europe and america 
So social work education, India has history of social work in Europe and America, which is a part of history, whereas there is no mention about any of the history of social work in India or in Commonwealth in the social work curriculum in America and US. I mean, sorry, in America or Canada. And that's okay. But other, in other words, the documented history is of course the history written by the lives of the victors. <laughs> that is one argument. And history is always his story. And only documented history becomes the history. And to document, we need to be privileged. And that privilege is available only for few people in the limited geographic locations of the universe. And that has been transferred to the rest of the world where we are forced to learn about those histories, perhaps neglecting our own histories. Uh, this is my last slide. Well, looking at the history of social work education, social work literature used in uh, Commonwealth countries, including in India, we see that there is that the theoretical production of social work knowledge is arising from a limited geographical space. So we need to look from a broader global south eastern perspective in social work literature. Very interestingly, the colonization and the colonized education has caused us to lose ways of thinking, imagining and living. So centuries of colonization has made us to think in a colonized mindset than the indigenous set mindset. And very interestingly, even the current academic discourses have to be in those elite Western styles of research and publication with not sufficient recognition for the indigenous ways of thinking writing, publishing, and scholarly work. So we may have to move from the um, Euro-American formulations to conversations like ones, diverse cultures of India, and India as such is very, very diverse. So even the social work practice methods that applies to one part of the country may not be perfectly fitting in the other parts of the country given the diversity in religion, in caste system, in power structure, in socioeconomic dynamics, the culture, the food, and several other aspects of it. And before I conclude, I wanted to also mention about the indigenous social work education in India also need to take up on, not on the hegemonic and hierarchical power structures, which is mostly based upon the caste system. So a re-understanding of the colonization social work education also has to understand the implicit power dynamics in knowledge production in the context of where often the subaltern perspective is not being recognized. There is, there is a kind of elitism based upon the existing power structures in society and the dominance of knowledge production and that dominance of knowledge production based upon the power structures arising from caste or class also need to be looked into when we talk about indigenous or social work education in Indian context. These are some of the references I have uh, made for this presentation. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I'd be more than happy to get connected to you if uh, there is further questions on these discussions. Thank you. Right, now let me um, introduce uh, the next speaker on our panel, Dr. Mina Anand, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of Social Work at the University of Delhi. Mina has been actively involved in working on issues related to gender, mental health and education for more than two decades. Formerly with Women's Studies and Development Centre at the University of Delhi, She's had several national and international uh, projects focusing on development issues during his specialized work experience 
with various grassroots NGOs. So, uh, Dr. Anand, it's wonderful that you can join us. Uh, over to you. Uh, a very, very warm uh, good morning, or may I say good afternoon to some of you. Uh, I hope I am uh, audible and my presentation yes, is visible. Yes. Uh, at the outset, I would like to begin uh, by conveying my heartfelt thanks to Dr. David Jones for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be a part of this prestigious and historic conference. I also wish to express my deep gratitude to Dr. George Palatil for sharing uh, with me about this conference, without which I now feel I would have really lost out on a lot of meaningful learnings. Uh, I will be sharing my perspectives on feminist social work um, in India, deriving an indigenous model of practice. And um, the broad contents of my presentation are going to uh, be as follows. I will begin uh, with a brief history of social work in India. I'll be talking about the genesis of women's movement in India, the broad points. I would be uh, talking about in brief uh, how feminism and social work profession are natural allies. Thereafter, moving on to feminist social work and trying to derive based on some successful grassroots experiences, some common key areas that emerge when we talk about uh, indigenous feminist social work. So, um, I will begin uh, quickly uh, with a very, very brief uh, 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 discussion on history of social work education in India. As uh, the former uh, uh, speakers have already shared that uh, in India, the professionalization of social work began uh, in Mumbai and uh, Tata Graduate School of Social Work was the first school which actually began with a diploma uh, in social service administration in 1936. It was in 1946 that our country got its second institution of social work, which was established by YWCA. And today, that is the institution where I come from, known as Delhi School of Social Work or Department of Social Work located at University of Delhi. Now, on the day India got independence in 1947, the first postgraduate department of social work began at Kashi Vidya Peet, located at Varanasi. Uh, around 1950s and 1960s, various schools of social work started in different parts of the country. The number was 35 by 1975, which actually rose to 53 in 1995. Uh, Today, we have more than 526 social work educational institutes in India, and these offer programs in various central universities, state, private, and deemed universities, as well as colleges. Now, if we look at uh, uh, how women's movement in India actually began, we realize that there are three broad waves of feminism or three main uh, epistemes or grids of intelligibility. Uh, these are the first wave, colonial wave, second wave, the national wave, and the post-national wave, which is also commonly known as the third wave from the point of view of India. Now, the first wave out of these three was actually the longest because it began in the early 19th century. And uh, that was the time when there were discussions around girls' education, women's education, uh, talking about practice of sati, demands for widow remarriages, raising the age of consent for marriage, female infanticide. However, this first wave was actually restricted to only women who belong to upper castes and upper classes. Now, in the second wave of feminism in India, uh, we realized that there was a lot of focus on women's agency. This wave began somewhere around 1970s, and here was a time when women began to be seen as beyond passive or mute victims of discrimination, injustice, and exploitation. And the third wave somewhere began uh, at the turn of the century, and here uh, the voices of the marginalized that were excluded till now, the Dalit women, the tribal women, women of color, women of uh, 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 who were differently able, women from ethnic and religious minorities, women with alternate sexualities, and even their voices began to be incorporated in the third uh, wave. Now, um, we are all... Uh, 
academicians, most of us. So I'm not really going to give any definition, but just want to uh, very quickly say that when we talk about feminism, we are, of course, there are many, many strands, various perspectives, various schools, but the school or the perspective or the discourse where I uh, identify myself is, uh, with is the one that includes not only women, but also men, persons belonging to alternate sexuality. So feminism for me um, uh, is not about women only, but about all genders, about equal rights, equal opportunities for everybody. And for me, when I talk about feminism, I feel that at the heart of feminist inquiry, we have to pay attention to power and how knowledge is built. Now, if we look at uh, uh, deeply, we realize that feminism and social work, they are actually common, uh, they have complementary frameworks and they are natural allies. Now, social work, we know somewhere when we deeply analyze is fundamentally feminist in nature. We, we uh, uh, follow the same values, ethical commitments, purposes, and even philosophical systems are, are having holistic and a common concern, both for feminism as well as social work. Because feminism is a theoretical, broader lens which we use in social work to explore, analyze ecolo in a, from an ecological perspective how the society is constructed, both historically as well as in the contemporary uh, times, and how privileges are maintained and how patriarchy is reproduced. Uh, both feminism and social work have complementary vision and common grounds because both believe in the values uh, of self-determination, both focus on individual rights of people and our basic principles in social work recognize the gender socialization that we have prevalent in our society and we believe in egalitarian um, relationships. We believe in nurturing human potentials among people rather than compartmentalizing males and females into sex-based binaries. Now, um, feminism, we know, celebrates difference. And as social work professionals, as social workers, we work with the difference. We believe in diversity across sexes, within sexes. And plus, we there has been a lot of discourse in the last two decades about recognition to LGBTQIA+, not only in feminism, but also in social work. We in social work, as and also as in feminism, have an eclectic approach. In social work, we talk a lot about focusing on the client and his or her environment looking from an ecological perspective on our client, the person as a whole. We recognize both in feminism and social work, the systematic inequalities within our societal structures and how these actually impact the individuals at micro level, meso levels, and also macro levels. And by breaking down the false dualism between private and public, feminism publicizes the hidden areas of women's oppression. And I just, just and, and I just shared, shared that both feminism and social work actually also now talk about including males because men are also equal victims of patriarchy and in the larger discourses, LGBTQIA+. So when we actually come to feminist social work, women are the starting points of analysis. However, the focus when we combine the feminism, feminist movement and social work profession, the focus by both is towards addressing structural inequalities and by looking at the client and his or her system from an ecological perspective. Now, uh, when I try to work and explore deeper into feminist social work, from an Indian perspective, I actually realize that there is very, very less uh, material uh, in the academics, within the theoretical discourses, when we talk about feminist social work from an Indian perspective, from an indigenous perspective. However, as my earlier speaker uh, shared, that India is known for its rich socio-cultural diversity, cultural plurality, and there are indeed very, very staunch intersections across gender, caste, class, race, ethnicity. There is a lot of poverty, uh, there are some people who are actually at the edge uh, and uh, there, there is a lot of marginalization as well. Uh, now, I would like to take this opportunity 
to very quickly share some of the grassroots narrative, some stories from the grassroots. Now, uh, this picture I take uh, from Pradhan, which is one of the very, very popular websites, uh, sorry, one of the very, very popular uh, non-governmental organization uh, uh, that works primarily in West Bengal. Now, one of the projects that I had an opportunity to study in detail, it's actually the Siagi project of Pradhan, which is funded by uh, Australian um, uh, uh, Center for International Agricultural Research. Now, this project focuses on enabling women to take control of their futures and to change their condition. Now, uh, they focused on self-help groups, SHGs, where women were actually trained through intensive strategies to come together and create a robust social capital. So actually, by bringing the women together, uh, this is one of the most uh, poorest regions in India. And uh, these villages, which are actually uh, on the periphery, uh, and they are people are extremely poor, they focus through this project on three indicators of nutrition security, food access, care practices, and health environments. So they work towards uh, instilling confidence, generating awareness among the SSG women, talk, encouraging them to talk and explore about the problems that they were facing and talking out solutions at the grassroots level through dialogues, through partnerships with, with, with the potential uh, stakeholders and also working with the government at the local level, at the panchayat level to raise their accountability. And uh, following ethical community engagement processes, this is one of the most successful projects, uh, which is not only popular, um, uh, one of the successful projects of Pradhan, but also at the uh, country level, it is one of their most popular success stories. Another success story which I want to share with the August gathering here uh, is the story from Telangana, south of India. Uh, this is... Uh, in a, a very popular organization called Deccan Development Society. And uh, this uh, organization was founded in 1983. And they work in about 75 villages with women's groups called as Sangathans. And the, the unique part about uh, this organization is that they work with the women who are Dalit women, also known as the untouchable women. And uh, they actually focus on uh, encouraging uh, women to develop climate smart agricultural practices. So these climate smart agricultural practices not only secure nutrition for the community, looking after health and also their livelihoods. Now this organization in the last few years has actually supported more than 2,500 women to reclaim their farmlands and they are they have been successful in actually generating more than 1 million days of employment for women uh, in 30 villages in the very first 10 years itself. And DDS has successfully not only built their seed bank, they also have this cafe that you can uh, see. It's called Cafe Ethnic, where they, uh, this is an initiative to encourage urban food consumers of the village to adopt millet and organic farm culture. They have a community FM radio, which is known as Women Speak to Women DDS Community FM Radio. And they are um, growing uh, medicinal herbs. And this organization has also been able to uh, get the prestigious Equator 2019 award, which is almost known as the Nobel Prize for Environment given by United Nations. They also managed to get Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation Award, which is one of the most coveted environmental prizes in the world for the year 2020. So uniqueness about DDS is that these women are not only uh, the poor women, with whom they started uh, working, but they are also the women and the families who belong to the untouchable uh, uh, class of society, section of society. Another third, uh, which is going to be my final grassroots narrative, is uh, uh, a story from Vadodara in Gujarat, which is west of India. And this is uh, an organization called Sahaj. And the project which I want to quickly capture 
is ensuring better matern maternal health care outcomes through community action and social accountability measures now uh, this project actually this organization was founded in 1984 and their entire focus of work is on social accountability and citizenship building for children for adolescents and women in two broad sectors the sector of health and the sector of education the usp about sahaj is that they focus on social accountability they work with stakeholders to ensure access to public services and improving their quality so they made maternal health a community issue rather than a women's issue and they work towards uh, building the awareness among people through baseline surveys followed by strategic uh, work with the women's collective with the panchayat members and they have been able to now it's a huge success story they have been able to now recognize maternal health uh, as a community health and they have evidence based practices which has been published in research studies uh, successfully and how they have actually utilized feminist social work though um, the, the, there are there is no uh, direct link uh when they uh, talk about their success stories but if we actually look and try to dig deeper try to explore we realize that feminist it is a pr principles of feminist social work that has been adopted by these organizations and it's not just dds or pradhan or sahaj there are loads and loads of success stories from from india and what we actually need according to me is to contextualize to assimilate to amalgamate within a feminist social work perspective there are loads and loads of strands of feminism even in the indian context but when we talk and explore uh, deeper about the indian grassroots success stories there is lot of work in the practice domain from a right space as well as a feminist perspective and all this most of it has been led by professional social workers so the key points which i think actually emerge you know is that we have to recognize from the fem indigenous feminist social work perspective that in india there are intersectionalities based on caste class race ethnicity gender what we need to really focus upon is or uh, derive uh, the from from global to local in the context of consolidation of traditional practices from a feminist lens at the indian grassroots so when we talk about empowering women to self introspect when we encourage them to self analyze when we encourage them to voice about their subjugation when we work towards building their capacities when we try to form women's collectives we are somewhere using the feminist lens particularly with the involvement of men as stakeholders as equal partners in this movement so the strengths and potentials the key points which i feel that uh, can be a part of indigenous feminist social work model is that we focus on unique local context through participatory dialogue not only with women but men and other stakeholders the strengths and potentials of women to be explored and nurtured to the fullest developing and uh, an understanding about dynamics of power structure issues of marginalization and oppression identifying and mapping of resources within the local context multi tier planning and multi branched interventions not only at the individual level but at the group as well as community level working towards capacity building of women and also talking about uh, inclusion of men and moving beyond the clear cut segregations and binaries across across the sexes and i feel that since india is very heterogeneous very large we have a very complex and multi dimensional socio cultural milieu and therefore we have to really focus a lot on a lot of emphasis on interface between macro and micro practice using the systems framework for bringing about the social change and since we in social work talk about theory practice amalgamation there are so many success stories at the grassroots all we need to is to explore more such uh, initiatives 
and we document these and we, we bring this to the classrooms through discussions, through conferences, through, through field work by academic community and we can actually strengthen these and we can actually work towards strengthening this model of indigenous feminist social work from an Indian, Indian perspective. Um, many, many thanks for this wonderful opportunity and I hope to be in touch and I hope to gain uh, deeper insights from this August gathering. Thank you. Very much, thank you, Srinu, for the excellent presentation. Um, uh, before I introduce uh, the final presentation of, of this morning, um, can I just remind people uh, in the audience to, if you have questions that you'd like fed into the, the discussion session at the end of uh, today, um, please put them, put them in the chat. Um, if you can make them nice and succinct, it would be easier to, to actually uh, present them to, to speakers. Um, so um, the, the final presentation uh, comes from my colleague, uh, David Jones. And if this conference has been about the international links of social work and the Commonwealth links, David's career absolutely exemplifies this. And he's been key in putting this program together and has done a huge amount of work. He is a, he, he, many of you, most of you will know already as a leading figure in the Commonwealth Organization for Social Work and indeed in the International Federation of Social Workers. Um, he uh, is a registered social worker qualifying in 1974. He has a doctorate from Warwick University uh, and he's a recognized expert in this field, having published and spoken globally on social work practice, um, social service management and the regulation of social work. And social services so we we couldn't have a better person to to round off the presentations this morning so over to you Dave. thank thank you very much um philip and um this uh, session looks as as you know has looked at new zealand australia and uh, has also um picked up on asia and malaysia and india and it's now the turn of of europe um there are three commonwealth countries in europe um, and that is uh, of, of um, Cyprus and Malta and the UK. Um, but I'm going to talk mainly about the UK, um, but uh, also pick up some issues around the Commonwealth and do it in a, a tight time um, because we're slightly pressed. So diving straight in, um, are we are uh, looking at um, regulation of social work and how is social work structured and managed? And we know that in a number of Commonwealth countries, um, there are different forms of regulation. I'm not going to describe them, they're all slightly different, but in Australia, there's regulation of social work education by the association, and there's discussions about other forms of, of statutory regulation of social workers. Um, Canada has got uh, shares with the United States, quite a, a, a lot of um, structures around regulation of qualifications and, and of social workers. It's different in every um, province. New Zealand has a statutory regulator, as does South Africa and Zimbabwe, not in the Commonwealth at the moment, but closely linked with Commonwealth culture. And I'm going to describe the United Kingdom. Now in India, Kenya, Malaysia, Nigeria, Trinidad and Tobago, many other Commonwealth countries, there are active discussions. But as Teo said, um, in Malaysia, um, there's a, 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 a been a long delay. I've in fact met people in the, in the government in Malaysia myself, but there's a struggle, there's ambivalence about regulation and there may well be things happening elsewhere. So COSWA is planning a webinar series on regulation um, later this year and into next year to, to share some of this experience. But we have to, can therefore ask out of that experience why do we want to regulate? What is regulation? How do we do it? What is the impact on the people who receive social work, on the social workers themselves? And I'm going to describe a bit about UK experience and think about what, um, what is needed. But why do we need regulation? Well, 
Um, there are a number of uh, possible reasons, but um, one is the foundation of principles and values that that is shared and agreed across the profession and social work. There's transparency and accountability for users and the public and other professions. There's the issue of predictability and consistency across the, the country or whichever section is, is regulated and issues of sanctions when things don't follow those um, consistent patterns. And there are issues of comparison with other professions. And this is particularly important for social work because we work in a contested area where values are challenging and also where the practice and what we do is challenging, including intervening in people's rights. But the core question in all of this is who defines the profession? To what extent do we do that for ourselves? To what extent do governments do it? To what extent do people do it? Um, and how is that defined? And that is shaped through regulation. I've written about this and there's a link at the end where you can see in more detail um, a discussion of these questions and other things. But there are all sorts of questions we need to answer when we're looking at regulation. And I put some of them here on the screen. And how do we do it and what are we regulating? We're regulating social work training. We're regulating the services and the structures of delivery. And we're regulating the practice and the behavior of social workers and different systems do that in different ways and, and have different emphasis. So if we're looking at the United Kingdom experience, which is a long history, but it's quite painful. Um, and I'm going to have to go through this quickly because of time, um, but um, the slides will be available and I've written about it in more detail elsewhere. We can see that from the very beginning of formal social work in the early 20th, even the 19th century, there was discussion about this. And some parts of social work were regulated at different stages. In the 1960s, social workers were coming together and social workers organizations. They formed the British Association of Social Workers. There was a big upheaval at that time in government structures and in qualifications. But at that time, as this all structure came together, the, the anti-professionalism movement, uh, the, the, the view that, social, that professions are conspiracies against the public, that social work needs to identify with people, and it's not a profession that has to be um, self-aggrandizing, um, that uh, that was very strong. And that shaped the debate about how regulation went. In 1970, the Central Council for Education and Training and Social Workers was um, established, and that continued, in fact, until 2001 as the government regulator of qualifications. And in 1976, the British Association of Social Workers approved in principle proposals for a scheme of accreditation. And there was work between a number of organizations that were trying to persuade the government that there should be regulation of social work in the same way as nursing and doctors and psychologists and indeed lawyers and architects and others. But in 1980, somebody in the, the, the um, sets where the, 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 the regulator um, said the cost and effort involved would be disproportionate. And the steering group of all that, that, that group published a final report, but all the political parties were opposed. The major employers were not convinced, that's local government, the voluntary sector and NGOs. And there were not many private providers in those days. And service users were also ambivalent insofar as they had a voice at that time. The consumer movement was just beginning. And social workers themselves were divided, often because of a concern about the negative impact of professionalism. So in 1982, there was a committee that looked at it again and said the case wasn't made. And you see the arguments there against it. There was already regulation by employers and so on, but the association continued campaigning. But in the 1980s, the context was changing. There was outsourcing of services. There were more employers. There were evidence of poor decisions by local councils um, about uh, individual cases where there had been abuse by social workers, but they were not dismissed. And there were child abuse tragic days. So there was increasing concern about standards. So there was a consultation in 1987 and a powerful group came together to form an action group which commissioned an independent study which published a book safeguarding standards and the, the, the action group turned itself into an implementation group and regulation of social work and social care was developed as a working model by that group. 
Alongside all of that, there were developments in Europe of mutual recognition of diplomas and um, the issues of comparability with other professions and other countries became much more significant. But the Conservative government at the time was not enthusiastic. They published a white paper um, which was setting standards, but they didn't want to go for regulation. But the Labour Party did, in the end, commit to legislation for a regulatory body as part of their values of modernising social services. And they won the election and very quickly moved to, um, to, to propose a statutory regulator, to develop a draft code of practice, and they passed an act in 2000, which created separate regulators in each of the four countries of the United Kingdom, and they developed codes of practice. Um, there was a consultation on protection of title, which has now happened, um, but, um, and there was a debate about how wide the, the regulation should be. Now, with them having set it up, it ran into problems. And in 2010, the G General Social Care Council in England was disbanded. There was no consultation. The government just did it and combined social work with the health professions. And they had no previous experience of, of regulating the health professions. But in 2016, again, without real consultation, the government said, no, we need to go back to a specific regulator for social work in, in England. And there was a big debate about that, but there was legislation that, that, that came into place. And um, BASWA uh, published expectations of, of regulation. And in 2019, Social Work England was launched, but there was not a single social worker appointed to the board, apart from the chief executive and the chair was a social worker or had been, um, but um, it was not felt important that there should be um, social workers as non-executives on the board by the government. And that was a source of great contention at the time. That has now since changed, which is really excellent. So looking at over the view, um, there's before 70, social work was very fragmented between 71 and 2001. There was a, a single qualification. There was an evolution of qualifications. The European Bologna process um, emphasised the importance of comparability and a degree level, but there's been constant tension between employers and universities and also some creative partnerships. But those working in this area of qualifications are wearily familiar with the frequency of structural change at national level. And the disruption of these changes in England only must have contributed to the uneven development of qualifications and not only in the social care sector. So we've had constant are coming to an end now, constant disruption. We've seen the relationship between the power of government and employers, the relationship between employment and higher education, and the real importance of having an authoritative and confident professional voice to work alongside service users with employers and academics. And the voice of the profession and the voice of service users are both important. We've seen a growing research evidence base, and we've seen a growing recognition of the key role of social workers, as was seen in the beginning with comments from Patricia Scotland and, and Anne Gallagher and Wendy Thompson, um, the importance of social workers. But there's also a tension with the regulators as there is in all countries where there are regulators, and particularly tensions between the regulators and the profession about who owns the profession. So will other countries in the Commonwealth work towards regulation? That seems to be what many people are discussing and it looks likely, but the big question of who defines the profession remains. Is it government? Is it the profession itself? Is it um, other groups? So that's a quick overview of regulation and the tensions between um, social work as a profession and government and the public view. And as we have move into the, the panel now, um, which I'm going to be chairing, one of the issues to, we can look at is to see whether um, we, um, as I'm stopping sharing, whether um, we, uh, 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 who, who owns the profession and, and how can we um, get a sh this shape. And when we talk about the clash with indigenous perspectives and local perspectives, is the real clash between social workers and governments or social workers and those in power and that, in fact, we find across the Commonwealth that social workers share many of the values, but the challenges are the structures that we work in and how we can actually make those 
um, more sympathetic to people. Philip, sorry, that was a big rush and time is pressing, but it's time now, I think, to move into the uh, um, the panel. But would you like to wrap up? And then no, that was that panel. was tremendously helpful and, and, and wide ranging, and it sparked a lot of thoughts in in my mind, David. 